Hi, you 11. This is Mr. Cocker. Just doing a quick, short kind of cut down uh, version of a lecture that we've run um, over the last couple of years in preparation for the Weimar Nazi Germany unit. Um, this section is just going to talk about topic one. Um, so Weimar Germany in the beginnings uh, and topic two, the rise of Hitler up until about 1933. I'm going to save life in Germany um, for a separate video. So um, this is um, the note sheet that we traditionally give out. Obviously, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, then you could make a copy of this as you go along. Um, it covers the main events. And as I said, we're just doing um, Weimar Republic and Hitler's life in power. We are not doing uh, life in Nazi Germany. Um, but it's just a way of kind of capturing your notes. Any kind of note taking will probably do. So we're going to look at uh, the crisis years and then the Weimar Republic's moment in the sun and then the impact of the Great Depression. So this is our kind of timeline uh, for this section. We've got um, this crisis then, this beginning years of the Weimar Republic, the birth of the Weimar Republic. And essentially, what caused this? What are the reasons for this? And your causation question is going to be that kind of explain why question. Um, and there are a number of reasons why there were problems for the early Weimar Republic. Firstly, it faced quite significant political threats from the left and the right. Uh, we see that first from the political left with the Spartacist uprising in 1919. Um, so this is a revolt led by Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. Um, about 100,000 workers uh, seized buildings throughout the city in Berlin. Um, and there were greater fears that there would be a kind of communist revolt, a red plague. Um, so uh, a guy called Gustav Nosk um, uses the army um, and the Freikorps, these free companies, of kind of ex-soldiers, uh, to cross, crush the revolt. Um, this volunteer kind of militia is made up of like ex-army who are strongly anti-communist, very, very brutal. The Weimar Republic really struggle uh, to keep control of them. Um, and we can see that in the outcome. So Liebknecht and Luxembourg were shot, um, but the revolt is crushed. And this counts as a win for the Weimar Republic. But they've created a little bit of a monster um, in the in using the um, the Freikorps because um, we see lots and lots of political violence. Um, and that is probably no better evidence than in March of 1920, literally just you know, less than a year later, uh, with the cap putsch. Um, sometimes referred to as the Freikorp Rebellion, where the Freikorps kind of turn on the Weimar Republic. Having initially helped them, they then lash out and, and, and become a major threat to the Weimar Republic themselves. So um, they're led by a nationalist politician called Dr. Wolfgang Kapp. He leads a revolt, um, again based in Berlin, uh, backed by the Freikorp, these free um, soldiers who don't really belong to the army anymore. Um, and they demand the return of the Kaiser the traditional right wing occupation at this point. Um, the regular army refused to go out and crush this revolt because they see uh, the people they're fighting as fellow soldiers and refuse to take part. So the only way the government could crush this revolt is to call on a general strike to actually use the political left, the kind of socialist and communist elements in society to stop work. They call a general strike. They um, grind Berlin to a halt um, and the putsch collapses. Um, but again, we've got a series of political um, assassinations. Um, right wing assassinations were a plague in the early years of the new republic. Um, leading politicians like Matthias Erzberger, uh, Walter, Rath uh, Walter Rathu are assassinated. Uh, many of the right wing murders um, are treated with, with quite a lot of, of leniency in the courts. Remember, the judges in Germany are quite right wing. So they they see this as um, not as acceptable, but they, they don't punish um these uh, right-wing assassinations very harshly at all. I mean, we see that when we get to the Munich Putsch and, and Hitler is barely punished for attempting to overthrow the government. It's all part of the same system. So our second reason then um, is that the Weimar starts with very shaky um, foundations. It's born out of the defeat of the First World War. Uh, there is confusion and chaos. Um, the Kaiser abdicates. Um, there is quite a, quite a significant move um, to by different political parties to seize control. It's more luck than judgment that sees a, a kind of social democrat party to some extent take control. Um, and this um, then leads to them being forced to sign the Treaty of Versailles uh, in 1919. And we use the word uh, diktat, a dictated peace. Um, this also begins to create the idea that the, the Weimar politicians had stabbed the German army in the back 
and the word the Germans use for this is Dolstost, is stabbed in the back. So we've got our Diktat, the Treaty of Versailles, and the Dolstost, the stab in the back theory. And they both really revolve around the Treaty of Versailles. And particularly the very, very harsh terms that that treaty had given, they lead to great resentment um, in the new government. They're often described as the November criminals uh, for signing the armistice, and the Treaty of Versailles just kind of confirms this. You can see here, I've just put those keywords on the screen. So the treaty became known as the Diktat, and those that signed it were labelled the November criminals. The German army, as well as the people throughout Germany, felt that they had been stabbed in the back, and the term for that is Dolstoss, um, to be stabbed in the back. Um, we see that through land loss. So Germany loses about 13% of its territories in Europe 11 col um, and all 11 colonies. Um, it has to give up land to Britain and France. 50% uh, of its iron reserves, 15% of its coal reserves are also lost as a result of this, particularly um, in uh, the demilitarized zone here in the Rhineland and on the Saar coal fields uh, between Alsace-Lorraine and uh, Germany. So these are the areas um, that cause problems. We've also got this, um, the loss of uh, the German port of Danzig here, separated um, by um, what's called the Polish Corridor. So there are some significant problems. Germany is quite significantly dismembered um, at this point. So that also creates a lot of anger and resentment. Um, we've talked about that already. Um, we've also got army cuts. So uh, Germany was forbidden from having submarines or an air force. Um, only six battleships in the Navy, an army of 100,000 men. Um, Germany was not allowed to place any troops in the Rhinelands, that demilitarized strip um, that's 50 miles wide that runs next to France. And then we get on to the reparations. Uh, we see lots of German uh, cartoons and actually cartoons from all around Europe um, about the reparations and the huge amount of money. Uh, 136,000 million marks, but it's, it's easier to um, remember that 6.6 .6 billion pounds. It's an easier thing, figure to kind of remember. And then this idea of blame. Uh, Germany has to take full responsibility for um, causing the First World War. We see this in the Treaty of Versailles in Clause 231. Um, and it becomes uh, a key resentment, both of um, the German people uh, against the Weimar Republic, but also uh, particular of the Nazis um, and Adolf Hitler when he comes to power. This idea that Germany has to take responsibility for the First World War uh, when they, in fact, did not start it. And then we've got our economic problems. Um, these begin because of the war. Um, the British blockade during the war has meant that Germany, the German people are starving. It's a very famous photo of a horse being eaten, uh, butchered in the streets for food. Um, but these problems continue largely because of the uh, reparations. Uh, but Germany has already used up its gold reserves. It has nothing uh, to pay um, the French um, or the British with. Um, and this leads to the French occupation of the Ruhr in 1923. Um, so Germany couldn't pay its reparations um, uh, that they owed between Christmas and New Year of 1922-23. They default on their payment. They just simply said nothing. Um, and this leads to the French and Belgian tr troops occupying the Ruhr um, and they intend to use Germany's productive industrial heartland um, to take payment in steel and coal. Um, and the impact this has um, is that the German government can't fight them. They don't have an army that will match them. Um, so they, um, they tell their workers to stop working. The French simply bring in their own troops or their own workers. But the German uh, government, the Weimar government, is committed to paying its striking workers, its passive resistance workers, and as a result, it's left with no other choice than to print more money. Um, the cost of this is that prices rise um, through inflation and they get to hyperinflation. Uh, by November of 1923, prices were a billion times their pre-war levels. Um, so this is these are the kind of key features that are going to go in that cause those early problems for the Weimar Republic. We've had our political problems, um, and now we've got our key economic problems. Then from 1923 to 1929, we enjoy uh, the golden years, the Weimar Republic's moment in the sun, as you will, where things begin to significantly improve. Um, this is largely due to the work of Gustav Stresemann in arranging American loans. Um, so there are some shaky foundations to the Weimar Republic's success, uh, but these American loans allow Germany to get back on its feet. Uh, in the 20s, there's a huge explosion in art and culture, um, and the Weimar Republic plays an important part in this. 
Uh, there's an architecture movement um, called the Bauhaus School, which is led by Walter Gruppius. Um, there are um, some amazing films uh, like Fritz Lang's Metropolis, the most technologically advanced film of its time. Um, we've got famous uh, actors like Marlon Dietrich, um, who was famous all around the world. So there are these huge improvements. You can see the, um, oops, you can see a, a few examples there. So it's Marlene and then Metropolis. Um, we've also got significant improvements in living standards. So wage increases, 10% uh, increase in wages. Um, the government also dealt with critical housing shortage in lots of parts of Germany. We see unemployment fall. Homelessness was reduced uh, by more than 60% by 1928. Um, there are millions of new homes being built. Um, tax breaks, uh, all really built, unfortunately, off the back of these American loans. And we'll see that uh, becoming a problem. We see the economic status of women improve, uh, more women going into work, more women um, moving in um, to equal pay with their male counterparts as a, as a kind of result of getting the votes. Remember, the Weimar Republic is the most inclusive democracy in the world, um, with everyone over the age of 21 being allowed to vote. Uh, women are free to dress uh, and spend their social time however they want. Um, the Nazis push back against this, um, suggesting this is not appropriate culture for them. But really, it mirrors what's going on for women in uh, America and Britain at the same time. Um, women are out, uh, allowed to go out unescorted, they're drinking, uh, smoking in public, wearing the latest fashions, uh, often relatively short skirts. Uh, they cut their hair short as well, um, which really kind of flew in the face of traditional uh, German views, which would be a long uh, flowing dress and a long, or a long skirt and long hair. You see the Nazis later push back against this. Um, so there we go. Let's move on to our um, other kind of key figure, our saviour of the Weimar Republic, which is Gustav Stresemann. So although he's only chancellor for a year, he goes on to become foreign secretary um, and he plays a really important part in resolving Germany's problems. Um, he establishes the Rentenmark, um, this new stable currency, um, which is really important. Got rid of that old worthless money, ends the hyperinflation crisis uh, and quickly brings um, inflation back under control. Um, we then get the Dawes Plan in 1924. Uh, which begins to make German reparation repayments manageable um, and brings in American loans to support this for the next five years. He signs the Locarno Pact, which begins to rebuild Germany's reputation as a great power after the kind of embarrassment of the Treaty of Versailles. Um, and we see Germany joining the other major nations of the world in the League of Nations in 1926. Um, so this really shows that uh, Stresemann has regained Germany's status as a great power. And these things all begin to ag address the problems and issues um, around the Treaty of Versailles. They begin to make the Treaty of Versailles more palatable. It looks like Germany is moving on and moving past um, the kind of humiliation of Versailles. Um, we see this again in the Kellogg-Briand Pact. Germany signs this pact promising not to use um, war to achieve foreign policy aims, um, but obviously that doesn't happen when Hitler takes control. And then the Young Plan of 1929 reduces German reparation payments um, to a figure around £2 billion from £6.6 .6 billion uh, and spreads that over a 59-year period. So Stresemann certainly turned things around for the Weimar Republic, therefore helping to bring about the Weimar, uh, Weimar Republic's moment in the sun. This was a huge undertaking considering the difficulties the Weimar Republic had faced in its early years. However, these things, unfortunately, do not last. So the Wall Street crash in October of 1929 plunged Germany into economic depression. And I know you're thinking, where is Stresemann? Surely he can save us. But unfortunately, Stresemann had died earlier that month um, and is not able um, to arrange uh, other deals or loans, even if he would have been able to. Um, so the German economy really struggles. Those American loans are pulled um, and um, there are huge uh, tax rises, businesses collapse, unemployment increases to well over six million people. Um, worse still, the man who'd helped bring this about uh, had died. He had a sudden stroke at the age of 51, um, which could not really have come at a worse time of the Weimar Republic. And so consequently, there are huge economic and social problems in Germany. Uh, in fact, the Weimar's failure to tackle the Great Depression was the thing that made it possible for Hitler to complete his path to power. Um, so to conclude, I fully agree that Weimar had its moment in the sun, 
Uh, but this was a brief moment. The Weimar Republic existed for 16 years and roughly 10 of those were flawed with problems it failed to solve or problems it could be argued were of its own making. So we get to the final part of our little mini lecture. Hitler's climb to the chancellorship. How does Hitler climb this mountain to become chancellor like prime minister of Germany? And we start with the context of the First World War. We add the failure of the Weimar Republic to this and the weaknesses of the Weimar Constitution. We then see the Wall Street crash, create economic depression. And from that, the mass appeal um, of the Nazis, Hitler promised very simple solutions to very difficult questions. Um, and the fear of communism meant that often lots of very reasonable middle class people were drawn towards um, Hitler's extreme right wing views because they feared losing everything. Um, in the in the Great Depression and or to the communists if there had been a, if there was a communist uh, revolution in Germany after 1929. And then political intrigue. Um, Hitler is great at kind of negotiating the political uh, system. Uh, the scheming between uh, Papen and Hindenburg um, allows Hitler to kind of claw his way to the top. And that eventually leaves Hitler in a position by 1933 that he can become um, not just chancellor, um, but actually he can unite the roles of chancellor um, and um, president to become the Führer, a title of his own making. And we see that road here. So the Enabling Act of 1933 gave Hitler power for four years um, to create new laws. Um, this is after the, the Reichstag fire, um, which um, allows him to remove opposition um, and consolidate his power further. We then get an oath of loyalty from the army um, that gives Hitler total military control. Um, then the creation of a, a terrorist state, um, particularly um, the use of his personal bodyguards, the SS, uh, Nazi law courts, the secret police, uh, concentration camps uh, for fear and intimidation, um, use of propaganda. Um, Joseph Goebbels in charge of that. Um, the idea of the, creating a Nazi ideal. Um, and pr promoting that ideal to people through television and radio speeches, uh, promises of things like the people's car, the Volkswagen, um, to kind of, you know, really bring on board our kind of more moderate middle classes. And then through education, we see uh, Nazis take control of the German curriculum quite quickly um, to try and create a kind of subservient youth who are totally loyal to, uh, to the Fuhrer. And these things lead to um, Hitler's rise to power. So this is where we're going to pause today. Um, we'll look at life in Nazi Germany in a separate video. Hopefully this has been useful. Um, if you've got any questions, let me know.